All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us, whoever's out there. And uh, welcome to uh, the Not So Royal Shakespeare Company's premiere uh, reading of Day of the Greeks. Um, I have a few words to say about this piece that I've written. Uh, and then after that, we'll start with the show. I started this project several months ago with a single question. How do people our age learn to remain hopeful in a world that is falling apart out of our control? I've had this question in the back of my mind for quite some time, but I think this year really pushed it out to the forefront. This year has been tough for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons, but I do think there are common feelings we all share. A sense of anxiety, powerlessness, as we all struggle to find out how we can contribute to furthering good in the world when it isn't ready for us. A loss of identity and purpose as all of our pursuits are, have been put on hold and we are instead forced to sit in this moment and look ourselves in the mirror for longer than we're used to. Which brings us to this piece. I set out to write a story about these feelings, about a gang of misfits driven by optimistic madness, getting thrown into all manner of comic shenanigans to make a difference in the world and ultimately falling short in spectacular fashion. But instead, I ended up with something far simpler, a story about a girl learning to advocate for herself and be honest about what she needs. A girl learning how to reclaim a mask, not as a tool of social concealment, but as a form of self-expression. A story about a girl trying to fit in and instead learning to be herself for the very first time. And so I'll end with the following. How do we remain hopeful in a world that is falling apart out of our control? By showing up as your most truthful self. Thank you and enjoy the reading. Baden, a polluted beach in the not so distant future. Past the water, the sky lights up in fire. A pair of black shoes steps into the sand of the beach. They belong to a mysterious stranger. We reveal his face, a stern older man. The explosions and fires in the distance in the world of the future become louder and brighter. The fire lights over the stranger's face as he looks in fear and awe. Crescendo to Day of the Greeks. Excuse me for a moment. We hear loud upbeat music, a sunny rock song. Neighborhood, Graymore High School, day. A song continues to play. Open on brown shoes, walking at leisurely pace, maybe in synchronization with the music. We follow the owner of these brown shoes, an upperclassman high school student wearing headphones and suspenders. He walks down the sidewalk without care in the world. His arms spread and he begins to vibe with the music. He gets to a steely four-story building that dwarfs him. This is Graymore High School. He enters the wide doors of the school. He passes through a metal detector and is immediately approached by a school guard. Hey, are you a student? Yeah, I just stepped outside for a second. I have class. Let me see your ID. The student pulls out a student ID from his pocket. He gives it to the school guard. The guard hands it back to him. All right, Vincent. You know you have to have that around your neck. Yeah, sure. Vincent continues to walk into the school building. He waits for the guard to be behind him and puts the ID back in his pocket. He enters a classroom not far from the main doors. The walls are grayish white. There are no windows. It resembles a standard study hall classroom. The students all mumble to each other. Class hasn't started yet. Vincent enters a room and initiates conversation with Reynolds, another student. Reynolds wears khakis and a polo shirt. Vincent goes up to Reynolds and hugs him. Hey, man. How you doing? I didn't see you in science class. Didn't go. <laughs> you didn't go? Didn't feel like it. We move away from Vincent, Reynolds, and the other students towards the entrance of the room. Entering center frame at the door is Sam. She wears cheap baggy clothes and plain white sneakers. Her face is the first we focus on. She sits by herself. She looks to her left and sees another student, Rowan, sitting by herself in stylish overalls. They exchange looks. Sam casually listens to the other students' conversations. The words blur together for her. Hi. Hi. You look kind of lonely all by yourself. You a freshman? Yeah, you? Sophomore. Cool. You've taken a theater class before? Oh, no, not really. 
they're fun. I'm glad our school finally got one this year. Yeah. I'm sorry. Do you want to be alone? What? No. Sorry. I'm Sam. Rowan. We turned to reveal Vincent's face for the first time, an older student with disheveled hair. I just don't understand how long it took for us to get a class like this. We can't get another art class when we still have four years of math. Uh, four years of science. I like science. I know you like science. Well, we got like a ton of scientists. What about musicians and painters and basket weavers? Basket weavers? Yeah, basket weavers. They do beautiful work. One of the oldest professions in the world and not a single class on basket weaving. Can we so basket weavers? more basket weavers? You can weave baskets if you want. I mean, I personally don't want to weave baskets. Why are you talking about baskets? I don't know. Someone else might want to do it. Why bother with all this other shit we're never going to remember? Science helps people, it's important. So does basket weaving. People like baskets. You're providing a service to the world. That's more abstract. You might be helping people, but you're never going to know how much good you're actually doing. It's a basket. You hold it, you feel it. A doctor saves someone's life, right? That's there. You can see the direct impact of it. But basket weaving, you never know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I don't, I don't think so. You see what I mean? I prefer to do something that's proven. I want to do good, but I feel like you can only really do that on a higher level. Sam overhears the conversation and looks over, quietly listening. Fair enough. Wait, higher level? What are you talking about? Look at the world. We're constantly at war. We're destroying our environment. Everything's going to shit. That higher level doesn't exist. Yeah, it's like... Sorry, I... Nothing. I'm just going to stop talking. Sorry. The teacher, Miss Wilson, arrives, exhausted. Hi everyone, thank you for waiting. Had a few final things to work out. I'm glad you all signed up for this. Can you see me? Okay. Hi everyone, thank you for waiting. Had a few final things to work out. I'm glad you all signed up for this, so thank you. Can everyone get in a center, in a circle around the center of the room? She gestures to the center of the room. The students all move and form a circle. I was thinking we start with a couple Warm ups, and then we'll go over names. Let's start with a few sirens. Start from the bottom. Miss Wilson leans and points downward, projecting a deep vocal sound. The actors follow. They all start to rise up, their pitches getting higher and louder, and Sam's living room, afternoon. Sam enters her home into the living room. Sam's mother stands on a chair trying to fix a broken ceiling fan. Hey, Mom. Hey, Sam. How was school? It was good. Sam moves straight from the door to her room and closes the door behind her. Once she is in her room, she breathes a sigh of relief and collapses on her bed. That evening, Sam's father enters the house after a day at work. He wears a cheap suit and holds a heavy work bag. He places the heavy work bag down and kisses Sam's mother. Sam does homework in her room. She overhears her parents talking. They can't take her IEP away. Are we going to need to sue? (sighs) Most likely. I don't want to do this again. But if we need to... The rest of the conversation is muffled. Time passes. Sam works on a few drawings on her bed. Sam's father knocks on the door. Sam? Can I come in? Sure. Sam's father opens the door and comes in. Hey, Dad. Mom says you've been really tired the last few days. Just school. Just school. Sam's father notices the Lego castle on the table. Oh, you finished it. How long did it take you? I lost track. Did you make any friends in your new class? Maybe. What do you mean, maybe? I don't know. Maybe. (sighs) Okay. I'm going to head downstairs. Love you, Riddle. Love you, Dad. He leaves her room. She turns to the castle and looks closely at a minifigure trapped inside it. She gives the figure a cape and fills with it in her hand. Graymore classroom. Day. Sam's foot below the classroom desk. Her foot begin- starts to tap up and down slowly. The class begins and the teacher's hand closes the divider between the two classrooms, cutting off Sam and Rowan. All right. Yesterday, we left off. The teacher's voice starts to drown out. She gives eye... Sam gives eye contact to the teacher. 
Sam's foot taps faster and louder until... Sam. Yes? Can you not do that? Do what? Your foot. Okay. The teacher moves on, leaving Sam alone. Sam recovers from the attention and starts to relax. As I've said before, your source projects are due May 22nd, but I will be collecting a full analysis of your sources a week before that, and that will be counting for... Sam lightly draws a smaller caricature of herself. She looks up at the clock and then erases her caricature entirely, leaving a clean, empty page. Sam looks out the window. The weather is sunny. A song starts to play, calling out to Sam from the window. Fade to Vincent's room. Night. The song continues to play, this time from a record player in Vincent's room. It isn't as decorative as Sam's room, but Vincent himself looks quite comfortable. He sits in his room, reading a copy of The Great Gatsby with the windows open. Lightning strikes. Vincent is startled at first, but keeps reading. It starts to rain suddenly. Vincent moves to the window and closes the curtain. He goes back to reading. Wind starts to whistle. It gets louder and louder until the curtains burst open and the wind gushes into his room, leaving his homework, his sheets, and all items in his room flying chaotically through the air. Vincent holds on to his book. The wind stops. Vincent hears a large closing from outside. It momentarily startles him. Deadpan, he closes the book. He walks over to the window and closes that too. He heads downstairs. Vincent walks out his front door to the cold outdoors. It has stopped raining. Vincent looks outward. His stomach growls. Cut to Vincent ki Vincent's kitchen, night. Vincent opens his fridge. He closes it again. He grabs a coat and keys and walks out of frame. In his garage, Vincent gets into a yellow Fiat. He pulls up from the driveway. The stranger from the opening of the film walks directly in front of the car, unaware of Vincent. Vincent hits the stranger. The stranger's face collides with the windshield in front of Vincent. Ow! Oh my god, I'm so sorry. Are you okay? I'm fine. Vincent gets out of the car. The stranger pushes himself off the car. He tries to stay on his feet, but tumbles into the mud. Vincent rushes to help him up. Oh, crap. The stranger realizes his nose is bleeding. He seems fascinated with it. Let me get you inside. Do you have any food? Cut to Vincent's kitchen, night. A hand grabs large selections of food from a pantry. The stranger gathers his bounty of food and stuffs his face in Vincent's kitchen. He wears a massive nose bandage. Can you try me? Not to make a mess, I'm really not supposed to bring strangers into the house, so it would be nice if you could... I wonder if I get to eat where I come from. If you could maybe pace yourself. I don't want to go on another grocery one. It's been a while since I've had a body, so... What did you say? You used to pee to broad rock, but I'm sick of it. Do you have any soup? Look, I'm going to need to wake up my parents, but first... The stranger, not paying attention, goes back into the pantry. He comes out excited, holding a package of noodles. What's this? Nifty noodles. I'm intrigued. People that make those are total assholes and it's all chemicals, but I mean- Can you please listen for a second? I need to, I need you to sit down and rest. I'm sorry. I will sit down. Vincent and the stranger move into the living room. The stranger sits down in a chair with his trough of food, including a bowl of nifty noodles. You know that's uncooked, right? The stranger magically warms the bowl with his hand. Vincent's eyes widen. The stranger looks at his wristwatch and eats his noodles. What's today? When am I? When are you what? I'm not used to the restricting confines of linear time. Past, present, future, it's all pretty new for me. Huh. Vincent thinks and then walks to his phone on the counter. What are you doing? I'm calling an ambulance. Why are you doing that? I think you might have a head injury or something. No, I don't. Vincent unlocks and begins dialing on his uh, phone. Just hold on a minute. Put that phone down. Trust me, I'm trying to help you. Don't do it. Hi, I'd like to request a- The stranger holds out his hand and the phone zips from Vincent's hand and flies across the room and sets on fire. Holy hell! The stranger eats a spoonful of noodles. Holy hell indeed. Vince? Vincent and the stranger turn and see Vincent's mom near the top of the stairs. You yelled. Everything's okay? Yeah, everything's fine. Who are you talking to? Vincent looks at the stranger, then back at his mother. You can't... No one. Okay, well, try to go to bed at a reasonable hour, all right? Yeah, of course. Vincent's mother goes upstairs and exits. She can't see you. Of course not. This can't be happening. You're, you're a hallucination. You have to be. I'm not a hallucination. I'm just going crazy. The stranger growls with food still in his mouth. Not a hallucination. Well, then why can't she see you? Because I'm a... Uh, what's the word? I uh, can't remember the word. He wanders back to his chair and collects a few more items of food. What are you called? D, d, d something. Dream, dead person, demon. That, that's the word. I'm a demon. He takes a huge cartoonish bite out of a hot dog. A demon, like evil demon. No, 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 not like that at all. The oh, stranger I'm... laughs. 
I'm here to corrupt you. Ooh, I'm gonna tempt you. No, I'm a demon in the Greek sense. Okay, I'm here to help you. How stranger swallows his food and sighs. You might want to sit down. They both sit down. May twenty second at seven forty five p.m. Several weeks from now, future will change forever. Small but irreversible event will transpire that will send the entire world into chaos. All right. This will trigger an ecological disaster in several years time. World governments will start to collapse. Billions will die. The world as you know it will cease to exist. I'm confused. Oh, please. You feel it. You all do. The current, the world crumbling apart piece by piece, and you helpless to stop it. Okay, and now you're starting to freak me out. How do we know you're real? The stranger finishes eating and stands up. He lifts his hand. Stand still. He holds his hand and makes a gesture with his fingers. Vincent backs up a bit. I'm not gonna hurt you. He lowers it on Vincent, and Vincent is transported to the beach of starfish in the post-apocalyptic future. We hear ominous drums. He walks across the beach in awe of his surroundings. He sees the starfish washed upon the shore. He sees the blasts of fire in the distance. What is this? Vincent crumbles to the ground and curls into a ball, terrified. This isn't happening. This isn't happening. This is the future if nothing changes. Greed, fear, carelessness. All the sins of your present culminate in this future. Vincent looks up from the sand and sees a fence, a factory with the Draco logo. You hold the Draco Corporation, the dragon that ate the world. Vincent grasps the sand and feels something buried, a dash of plastic red and a pair of white sneakers, Sam sneakers. What do I do? What do I do? Stand up, Vincent. You can escape this. The beach starts to change. The sun comes out and color returns for a moment, a glimpse of a hopeful future. Vincent stands up. The world needs you. What does it need from me? Cut to Graymore Cafeteria, day. Sam gets lunch in the cafeteria. She gets a couple items on the food, but no tray. She sits by herself. She observes the other tables. Sitting at another lunch table, Reynolds talks to a group of students. I'm thinking of doing a year of service, but if I get the internship offer, that'd be big. I mean, it wouldn't be that fun, but it would set me up money-wise, you know? Sam looks at the other students socializing with each other. She goes back to her lunch. The cafeteria itself has windows through which you can see the hallway. Vincent appears from behind one of these windows. He gestures to get Sam's attention. Sam notices him. He, she pauses for a moment in confusion. She then recognizes him from rehearsal. She takes her belongings and walks toward the cafeteria entrance. She waits until no one is looking and then leaves through the cafeteria doors. Sam looks behind her and then at Vincent, who approaches her with urgency. Sam, you're, yeah, you're Sam, right? Vincent notices a school guard. Vincent notices a school guard approaching their location. Come here. Vincent starts to leave away from the cafeteria hallway. Come here, this way. Sam follows him. Vincent and Sam sit in the hallway far from the cafeteria. They eat their lunches. Neither of them have trays. Some time has passed. Vincent's hair is even more disheveled and he looks visibly fidgety. He tries to hide it. So like, I'm thinking, what if the second coming of Jesus Christ will not be a person, but a movement? Okay. And what if that movement will be people saying like, hey, maybe we shouldn't go to war. Maybe we shouldn't kill each other. Like the 60s? Yeah, exactly. What if the 60s was the second coming of Jesus and we just didn't know it? What? A school guard comes by. What are you doing in the hallway? We're having lunch. Have lunch in the cafeteria. You're not supposed to be in the hallway. Okay, we'll go back there. The school walk guard watches as Vincent and Sam walk toward the cafeteria. The school guard follows them for a bit and then goes back to her patrol. Vincent dashes into a corner of the school, unnoticed by guards. Sam follows. Do you know who Marvin Gaye is? Yeah, I know who Marvin Gaye is. You know that song where Marvin Gaye is going like, what's going on? What's going on? That's exactly what Jesus would be saying if he saw us today. Are you saying that you think Marvin Gaye is Jesus? Maybe he goes, mother, mother, there's too many of you crying. Brother, brother, there's too many of you dying. That's exactly what Jesus would be saying today. Okay. And then we also have like how God had to let Jesus die. So Jesus was killed by his own dad, kind of. And then, you know, you have Marvin Gaye, whose actual dad killed him. All I'm saying is maybe the second coming already happened and maybe it didn't work. And now we need to do the work ourselves. What are you talking about? But we don't have much time. You know what I'm saying? You don't know what I'm saying. Okay. What I'm trying to say is... Vincent looks ahead and sees the stranger down the hallway. What if we could change the world today? Like, actually change the world? What do you mean? What if we didn't have to wait? 
What if it was possible, a single event, a show that could pivot the world in the right direction? I don't know, sounds kind of big. Maybe it is, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. We believe that things are impossible usually because they've never happened in the past, right? And because they've never happened before, they're unrealistic, but just because something hasn't happened before doesn't mean it can't ever happen. I mean, every major event in human history was a first of its time, right? There was always a prime mover. How would a show like that change the world? I mean, what would it even be about? I don't know, anything, pirates, space. I don't know, what do you want to write about? Sam laughs, <laughs> Vincent gestures to her to keep her voice down. That's dumb. What do you mean that's dumb? It's dumb. You give me this whole spiel and you don't even have an idea for what the show might be. Well, I don't know yet. But with a little bit of time, we have time now. The bell rings. Students pour out of the classrooms. Shit. Okay, hear me out. After school today, I'm gathering a couple of people to the lighthouse. You want to come? To help on your show? Yeah, seven, the lighthouse. I don't know where that is. Look it up. There's music and art and coffee. It's great. You drink coffee at seven? If you want to go, go. I'll be there. Vincent stands up. He throws his lunch out and walks away. Sam stands up, perplexed. Grimoire Classroom. Day. Sam sits in class, studying the teacher's lecture. She writes in her class notebook. She slows down before stopping altogether. She starts drawing a curved line running through the paper grid lines like vines around a fence. She lightly draws a spaceship in her notebook. She erases it again and looks once again at a blank page. For your source analyses, you should at minimum have a paragraph explaining why you chose your source. She looks outward at the window. She then looks at the classroom divider. The bell rings. Students rush out of classrooms to the next period. Sam rushes out and looks for Rowan, the classroom over. Rowan! Rowan! Sam gets Rowan's attention. Sam, hi. What's up? You want to work on a show to change the world like Marvin Gaye almost did back in the 1960s with me and a guy from our class later today at the lighthouse? What? Sam furrows her brow. Rowan smiles patiently. I'm sorry. What I meant was, are you free later today? Yeah, I am. Why? The guy from our class has this show he wants to do. Can you come with me? I need backup. I don't want to go alone. Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, cool. It's at the lighthouse. Do you know where that is? Right by the bare furnishing store? Yeah. Cool, cool. Awesome. Great. Sam rushes off to her next class. Neighborhood. Afternoon. Sam rides her bike in the neighborhood sometime after school. She feels the wind on her face. She rides faster, impatient to get to her destination on time. She looks behind her and sees Rowan following her path, also on a bike. She looks forward, determined. The lighthouse, afternoon. The lighthouse, a deceivingly small looking cafe with a bohemian aesthetic, brick walls, an open alley, and street art. Think 1960s Piper's Alley in Old Town Chicago. Sam and Rowan walk in. From their faces, you can tell this place is alien to them. The lighthouse itself is cozy, if a bit claustrophobic. A single room reaching all the way to the alley with a recreational area with couches at the far end. The cafe has good crowd. Strange community art pieces decorate the walls. The chairs are all made of aging painted wood. Vincent sits in the recreational area at the end of the room with another student playing a ukulele. This is Chuck. Chuck wears a bright yellow polo shirt, khakis, sandals with socks, and sunglasses indoors. Part preppy fitness nut, part 1950s crooner. Sam, over here. Sam and Rowan pass through a number of people to get out to the recreational area. Strange looking people come in and out of the cafe, a Star Wars cantina on the planet Earth. Sam and Rowan sit down with Vincent in the recreational area. In this corner, there's a collection of band equipment, children's books and crayons, lots of crayons. The place is simultaneously a good place for parents to take their children and a favorite spot for 90s grunge bands. You're Rowan, right? Yeah. Cool. This is my friend Chuck. I'm Chuck. I'm Sam. Okay, what's this all about? Vincent goes into his torn up messenger bag and pulls out pages of a script. In my hand, I hold the pages of a play. A play I believe will save the world. Yes, we're gonna put it on together, all of us. Okay, baby. Sam, can I talk to you for a second? Rowan and Sam go to the corner of the cafe away from Vincent and Chuck. I don't know about this, Sam. You sound... Domestic? Crazy. Maybe that's a good thing. I can actually talk like... Talk like... I don't know, it's different. I don't know what he sees in us, but... Okay, you brought me here. Come on, Rowan, this is exciting. I've got a good feeling about this. But still, what's he talking about? I don't know either, but let's hear this out, all right? Okay. Rowan and Sam go back in. You guys in? Maybe. Where will we put this on? 
They're in the back area here. With the right resources, we convert it to a stage area. Super professional. Who's writing the play? Vincent looks to his left and sees the stranger sitting next to him, still with his bandage. No one else can see him. The stranger takes a bite out of a chicken wrap and regurgitates it. The wrap bursts into flames and dies out in a few seconds. He takes another bite, enjoying it this time. I am. I have the script. We can work on it together. So how does this save the world then? Image. A noodles wrapper with a Draco logo. Image. The dark woods in the future. A fence. An ominous factory. It. A long pause. I'm sorry. Is it my turn to talk? Uh, I'm not being rude. I'm genuinely asking. You're all good, Sam. I don't know how it saves the world, but I think it's going to start with showing up. The stranger leans back. Showing up? I don't know. I feel you. This is groovy. I'm in. You're in? Yeah, I get to do something outside of school. Why not? He's right. It's not like we have anything like this at school. Rowan sighs and smiles. Okay, how do we start? Vincent's script pages from his bag are slammed on the table. Vincent, Sam, Rowan, and Chuck pick them up. These are the next few pages of the script. I can get another actor, but we need someone on crew. I got you. Perfect. That leaves transportation. I can drive, but I don't know how often I can get the car. Do any of you have a license? Silence. No one raises their hands. They all look at each other. Now you, Chuck? I don't believe in the automobile as a necessary element of transportation. I walk. Okay. Yellow Fiat. Day. Chuck, Rowan, Sam, and Vincent all enter Vincent's yellow Fiat one by one in slow motion. The stranger looks at his wristwatch and sees them depart. Abandoned church. Night. Sam and Chuck walk over to an abandoned church late at night. This is the place. This is the place? Yep. We'll find him here. The church basement. Night. Sam and Chuck enter the basement of a church. It has been converted into a den of grunge bands, hipsters, and God knows what. Everyone smokes. That's him. Chuck points over to a cards table where a cluster of people have been gambling. A lanky dude with dark hair wearing various rings sits at the center of a table, simultaneously holding his own in a game and yelling obscenities in various languages. This is Bert. Bert looks up and recognizes Chuck. Hey, baby. Bert, in a black trench coat, joins Sam and Chuck outside. Bert checks his phone. Sam and Chuck watch him. Just checking something. My mom's getting home from work late tonight, so I've got a bit of time. All right. So, yeah, the plan is... Art to save the world. That's the idea. What makes you think the world is worth saving? Sorry, who is this? Oh, Sam, this is Bert. Bert lights a cigarette. I walked in the park a few blocks from here. No cell reception there, so free of distraction. I listen, the birds, the trees, but I haven't fully found something yet. Really, no. God, Brahman, the transcendent. I want to connect with that. Join our mission, then. I'm open to this, but I must admit, I have motivations of my own. And if they stand in the way of shit! Shadow passes by and startles Bert. A car? A raccoon? Oh, God, what was that about? I'm sorry, I thought I saw a bear. A bear? I suffer from orsophobia. Fear bears? I don't think that's the official term. Oh, it's official. It's a completely irrational fear, but we all have our weaknesses. I will help you. And in turn, I hope to find serenity as you have. Until then, I must go. Bert runs into the distance in frame in a rather cartoony, dramatic exit, vanishing into the shadows. That's our crew guy? Chuck takes off his sunglasses and smiles. That's our crew guy. <laughs> English classroom, day. In English classroom, students write notebooks. A substitute teacher looks at his phone, not paying attention. The door is still open. A student in the far back of the classroom reads a book leisurely. She wears a bandana. This is Veronica. Vincent almost enters the classroom, but notices the substitute. He looks at Veronica. Veronica sees him. She smiles and gestures him to sneak in. The same classroom a few minutes later. I don't know, Vincent. Come on, Veronica, this is a big deal. It's our last chance here. This is our chance to not stress about everything. You want to throw that away? I'm not throwing anything away. I just need to do this. Do this, do that. That's exactly what I'm saying. You don't need to do anything. That's not what I'm saying. This thing is driving me crazy. I need to, you know, I need to. They're getting to you, Vincent. You're buying into it. That's how they brainwash you. Brainwash? Your voice is down. It is not a free period. Sorry. Vincent looks toward the substitute and sees the stranger outside the classroom. Vincent's eyes widen. The stranger points at his wristwatch. What is it? What is what? What are you looking at? V Veronica turns to the direction of the stranger. She doesn't see him. I'm not looking at anything. You're looking at something. No, I'm not. Why are you nervous? I'm not nervous. Why would I be nervous? You're bored. I'm bored. Yes. I'm not bored. 
Yes, you're bored. You're worried that if you don't, if you aren't doing something useful for a single moment, what's the thing? What do you think? That's how they get you, Vince. It's all about hard work and achievement, right? They tell you to be productive for the sake of being productive. And then you work and work and work until you're boom, you're 70 years old and you've wasted everything. Vincent looks at the stranger who starts banging the door. No one hears it. This is not about productivity for pro- What? What have you been smoking? Veronica looks at the substitute. He doesn't pay attention. The stranger bangs the door again and Vincent reacts. Again, no one hears it. Veronica, Veronica, this is serious. The world is in real danger. You're in danger. We can pay you? What? Like a little bit? I don't... You're completely missing what I'm trying to hey, say. Hey, keep your voices down. Sorry, it won't happen again. Okay, 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 okay. I'm sorry. Veronica stares him down. Vincent takes a breath. Look, you know me. I don't care about any of this shit. I'm ready to get out as much as you are, but this, this is something I want. I want to do something that means something. I want to do it with you. Vincent, we don't have a lot of time left. I know. And this is what you want? Yeah. Veronica looks at Vincent. Okay. Okay. Ver- Vincent holds Veronica's hand. Veronica looks at him. What's wrong? What do you mean? You're afraid. Afraid? Afraid of what? I don't know. Veronica and Vincent smile at each other. The stranger outside walks away impatiently. Grimoire classroom, day. Sam glances at the clock. She takes notes in her notebook with an assigned class group. In another group, Reynolds shares a picture on his phone with a friend. He's so cute. Phones away. Sam struggles to help her group. She starts doodling. In the next classroom over, Rowan also takes notes in her notebook. Now, I want three primary sources and three secondary sources. Online, I recommend- We move between Sam and Rowan, both watching the clock, struggling to pay attention in class and doodling notes on their play in their notebooks. Grimoire Cafeteria Hallway, day. Sam selects items for lunch in her cafeteria. Once again, no tray. She waits until no one is watching and escapes the cafeteria. Sam sees Rowan stealthily standing by a wall near the end of the hallway. Back out of class. Hall. Sam and Rowan sit at the same corner of the hallway, the same corner where Vincent attempts to recruit Sam. They try to keep their voices down. I still don't understand what Vincent's trying to do with this play. Does it matter? I mean, I guess not. How are you doing online so I'm off book. Already? How are you- I couldn't put it down. I just spent the whole week going through it. That's wild. I'm not a genius. I just wanted to do it. You know they're going to make changes, right? Oh, God. <laughs> a school guard passes by and stops. Do you have a class you're supposed to be in? Patty Hall. Well, you shouldn't be in the hallway. Okay, well, we'll just move. No move. You need to be in a classroom. Okay, uh, we'll go back. Sam and Rowan start to walk away. The school guard follows them. He continues to follow them. Sam and Rowan look at each other. Rowan and Sam slowly arrive at the door to Rowan's study hall. Rowan starts to walk in. Sam stops. Rowan looks at Sam. The school guard watches. This is not your classroom? Sam stands silent, not knowing what to say. All right, come with me. Sam follows. Cut to Sam's living room. Day. Sam's mother listens on the phone. Sam's in the room. Detention? For what? Missing attendance. It was lunch. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sam's mother hangs up the phone. She turns to Sam. I get it. But you don't need to be getting into trouble for this. Mom. It's small. I don't have anyone to sit with. My friends are in different classes. I was having lunch with my friend. Is that a crime? No, but I don't want you getting into trouble. I don't want this to add up. Your father and I can't have that. Stupid. Is there a way you can get a pass? They won't allow that, Mom. Sam's mother stops for a moment. You're right, okay? You're right. But there's not much you can do right now. Mom. You just need to push through it, all right? It'll be different in college. I don't want to wait that long. I'm tired of waiting. You're going to have to wait a little longer. You owe it to your future self. Sam sighs. All right. We're on the same team, okay? Don't forget that. Okay. Sam gives a hint of a smile. Jeffrey's yard, day. Sam, Vincent, and Chuck all stand heroically in a green yard with the wind blowing in their faces. Chuck wears sunglasses. In front of them, a large tent stands in the yard. So this is our last one. Last one. Is he gonna come out? Yeah, he'll come out. Do we wanna go in? Invade his privacy? Come on, Sam. Sorry. 
You don't need to be sorry. I don't feel anything. You don't feel anything? Yeah. I feel chill, classy all the time, you know. Oh, sounds exhausting. They wait a bit longer. Sam sits down in the grass. Why are you wearing sunglasses? It's 30 degrees. It's a style choice. A moment of silence. This guy, Jeffrey, he's not weird, like... Here, Jeffrey, he's not weird at all. He's cool, trust me. Totally chill, totally normal. Okay, he's coming out now. The entrance of the tent. Jeffrey emerges from the tent in slow motion, long hair blowing in the wind. He wears a Pink Floyd t-shirt, or maybe a Grateful Dead t-shirt. Flash Gordon-esque music accompanies his entrance. Jeffrey smiles at Vincent in a goofy grin. Vincent smiles back, also in a goofy grin. Light, sound, magic. You got it. The lighthouse, afternoon. Sam enters the lighthouse and struts down to the recreational area. In the recreational area, Vincent and Jeffrey use crayons to drop a lighting and sound plan. Sam sits across from them. Veronica lays on the couch, putting her feet up against Vincent. She reads her script. Veronica turns and sees Sam. Sam smiles at Veronica. Veronica smiles back. I'm Sam. Hi, I'm Veronica. You're acting in the show? Yeah, I guess I am. Vincent says you're going to Northwestern next year. You must be really smart. I don't know. Maybe you want to get high? The lighthouse, night. Veronica and Sam share a blunt in front of the cafe. So I saw him years later, and I swear, they turned him into an android. An android? A robot. Really. There were moments. One time he came into the office, you see, put down his bag, sat down, and froze. He then stood back like this, and he went, I need to recharge, and then left the room. And that's what I'm saying. You gotta escape that. Be you, you know? That's not helpful. <sighs> What do you mean? It's not useful. I can't use that. I can't, I can't do that. Why not? You don't, you're not like. Sam stops herself. Veronica scans her. Hey. Veronica stands up on a table, almost losing her balance. Get up on the table. What? Yes. Up. Sam notices a few people from inside are looking at them. They're looking at us. Why wouldn't they be looking at us? Hello? What? With me, Sam. Hello, fucker! Sam also gets up on the table, then sits back down. I can't. I can't. Come on, Sam. Vincent hey, enters. Hey, guys. Come on inside. I gotta show you something. Vincent, come on. Get on the table with me. Veronica grabs Vincent's hand and twirls herself. <laughs> Veronica! Veronica! Vincent, come on. Veronica, you goddamn pirate. What? Let's go inside. I gotta show you something. Lighthouse back room. Night. Vincent leads Veronica and Sam to a large back room with what appears to be a stage. There are also a ton of chairs. Vincent flips a switch and the lights turn on. Vincent! Sam sits on the edge of the stage. She looks up at the house. Wow, how did you get this? We talked to the owner. A hundred seats. In five weeks, every chair will be filled. Now this is what I was thinking. She sees a small hole in the ceiling. Light shines through. Transition to the same hole in the ceiling. It's now covered up. The back room of the lighthouse has been converted into an indoor proscenium stage with mics and lighting equipment. Sam, Veronica, Chuck, and Rowan play on the stage, rehearsing improvised scenes and smiling. Bert surveys the stage, and Jeffrey rushes to the booth to play with the new equipment. Vincent stands in the back of the room. The stranger stands behind him, scanning his wrist and eating from a bowl of noodles. How much time do we have left? Four weeks. Can we finish the show by then? We'll need to. What if we run out of time? We can't run out of time. I mean, why us? I still don't understand. Off my script, you follow those pages. What's there not to? Uh, but just, are you saying you don't trust me? Yes, I trust you. Because if I didn't, I'd be crazy. And I'm not crazy. I'm trusting the work. Just how am I supposed to get people to come? Just put on the poster, hey, come to the show where the world's gonna end. Maybe allude to it? That's not how you market it. And the people we've recruited, I don't know how reliable they are. I mean, Bert. Bert is the epitome of reliability. But Jeffrey? Look, I love Jeffrey, but deep down, I know he's going to do some weird avant-garde shit, and I'm not rich to ready. I'm not sure if I'm ready for it. All right. Okay. Okay. I believe in this. I see no flaws in this plan. Vincent and the stranger go over to Jeffrey, who stands with a cardboard box of makeshift lighting and sound equipment. All right, Jeffrey, what do you got for me? Okay. All right. I got Foley sounds. I got flashlights. I got strobe lights. I got lava lamps. I got walkie-talkies. I got exercise balls. I got a sandwich. Great, 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 great. Exercise balls? 
for exercise. Brilliant. Sam walks over to her phone sitting on the stage. She sees that she's gotten a text. Here are the next few pages of the script. I'm gonna step outside and order some more food. You take an order? No. He walks out. Sam opens her phone and sees her text. It's from her mom. Got a call from your teacher. You've been missing assignments? Sam puts her phone away. Hey, Sam. Sam goes up to Vincent. I need to run a few things, but we need binders. Can you just take the Fiat and get them really quick? I'll give you my keys. Yeah, yeah, I can take them. Vincent gives Sam his keys. Sam makes her way to the exit of the stage. She looks at her phone again. Call me. Sam visibly becomes anxious. She waits until she gets out of line of sight to the stage and leans on the wall. She tears up and starts to have a panic attack. Rowan, Bert, and Chuck all come to check up on her. Sam, everything all right? I'm, I'm, I need to. I'll come with you. Bert and Rowan hold Sam's hand and walk outside to the car. Chuck follows. Chuck, Bert, and Rowan all join Sam in the Fiat. Bert in the front passenger seat, Chuck in sunglasses, sits in the back seat behind Bert and Rowan in the back seat behind Sam. Sam tries desperately to avoid an anxiety attack. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. My parents, my grades, the source project, I need to get binders. It's all right, Sam, relax. relax. Chuck holds Sam's hand. Rowan joins and Bert follows. Sam tries to breathe. One thing at a time, baby girl. Sam starts to relax. One thing at a time. There you go, there you go. Sam gets her breath back. Okay, okay. 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 They all release their hands. Sam starts the car. I got this. I got this. Sam moves the I car got... forward just in time for the stranger to walk in front of the car. Boom. The stranger gets hit hard and rolls over the Fiat, hitting the pavement behind them. Holy shit! Vincent comes outside the lighthouse directly after hearing the collision. Bert leaps out of the Fiat to the back of the car where the stranger landed. What? Vincent looks at Bert in surprise. Suddenly the stranger and a few pages of his script vanish into thin air. What the shit? Oh no. Vincent freezes in shock. From the car, Sam sees Vincent's face and also freezes. What have I done? Chuck calls out from the back of the Fiat. Is he all right? He's gone. What do you mean he's gone? He's gone, like gone. Well, that's ridiculous. I'm telling you, he's full on Obi-Wan Kenobi, he's gone. Chuck stops for a moment. He gets out of the Fiat to see for himself. Chuck, unfazed, stares at where the stranger should be. He still wears his sunglasses. He looks under the car, then to the pavement, and finally in the trunk. He then immediately walks away and gets to the Fiat. Sam's petrified face in the driver's seat. Chuck enters the car, back in his old seat. What have I done? What have I done? What have I done? What have I done? Chuck takes off his sunglasses and holds Sam's shoulder. Well, it looks like you killed him. Sam yops and buries her head in the steering wheel. Chuck pats her shoulder. Vincent's living room, day. Sam, Veronica, Chuck, Bert, Rowan, and Jeffrey all sit scattered in Vincent's living room. Vincent stands in the middle. He fidgets clearly in stress, but smiling, trying to keep it together. All right, guys, we're a few weeks out, and we're going to need to start thinking of fundraising. Any of you have any ideas? What about the dead guy? There is no dead guy, Bert, now. Ideas. Big sale. Great idea, Chuck. Vincent, what's going on? Anybody else? A couple of my gambling buddies owe me money. I can ask them. Magnificent. Great job, Bert. Vincent. What? You're fidgeting. I'm fidgeting. Yeah, <laughs> what's wrong? I'm having a bit of trouble on the writing side, but there's nothing we can't handle. I'll figure it out. Right now, I need you all to brainstorm, set, props, decor. What do you got? Get stuff at bare beds and furnishings. Bert and I can- That's not a good idea. Why not? What's wrong with it? Bert has a thing with bears. Ring? I have an irrational fear of bears. God damn it, Bert. I volunteer. I'll get the stuff. We don't have any money. I'll figure that out when we get there. What about a bake sale? Eh, I was spitballing. Now that I'm thinking about it, I'm a bit insecure about my baking skills. You just said. What about the dead guy? Bert, I told you there is no dead guy. Close on Sam, her eyesight blurs. Image, a flash of the polluted beach from Sam's POV. The fire, the fence, the factory, the stranger. An end, dark, endless hallway moving forward. Ominous drums. Sam trapped inside as the hallway moves around her and the drums get louder. Sam snaps out of it, disoriented. Secondary living room in Vincent's home, day, a few minutes later. Vincent's face from the other side of the window. Rain hits the window. Sam slowly enters the room. Hey, Vincent? Sam! Bert and I were thinking of meeting up at the abandoned church tonight to look for the last remaining pages. You know, salvage Vincent. what we can. Sam freezes. Vincent waits for a response. Sam? I don't know why, but I have this really bad feeling that somehow the show is falling and 
I'm responsible for all of it. What? No, you have nothing to feel sorry for. I said, what did I do? Okay, so this might sound hard to believe, and you might think I'm crazy, but I may have received a visit from a demon, or at least I think he's a demon. The good kind, though, not, not you know, the Greek D-A-E kind of demon. But anyway, the show may have been his idea, and you may have hit him with the car, and now he's gone, but... Oh my god, I've ruined it! But it's okay! It's okay! The whole script thing is a blessing in disguise. See, now we have to finish this thing ourselves. That's gonna really push us, you know, really free us up to make the show as big and professional as we want it to be. Vincent! It's gonna be more impressive when we get this show off the ground. We're gonna blow people away. Vincent! I know you don't believe me, but trust me, whatever happened out there happened for a reason, okay? This show is just getting started. We just need to work harder, that's all. Work harder? Yeah, we just need to work harder. What about Rowan, our classes? You can do both. We just need to buckle down for a couple more weeks. We gotta see this to the finish line. Okay. Bare beds and furnishings, night. That night, bare beds and furnishings. The store is closed for the evening. Chuck, Veronica, and Jeffrey all emerge from couches inside. All right, let's get stocked up. Chuck, Veronica, and Jeffrey get out of the couches. Rowan emerges from another couch, struggling. For the record, I am not on board with this. Okay, we need two chairs, about 20 bucks, a table, and a telephone, and a couch. Got it. Jeffrey, you got everything uh, V said? Yep. Okay, great. Let's go. They crouch down and scout the place like Navy SEALs. Chuck picks up two chairs. Jeffrey picks up a table. Veronica collects books and a telephone. What am I supposed to do? Uh, see if you can get us an exit. Rowan goes to the window and tries to pry it open. She checks for a locker lever. Nothing. I am not on board with this. The abandoned church. Night. Vincent, Sam, and Bert all sit around a fire outside the abandoned church. Bert, shirtless, faces Vincent and Sam. He tends to the fire. He picks up pages of the stranger's script and tosses them in the fire. That's our script. That's your script. We need to find where the story ends. Vincent leans in. Bert begins to see something in the fire. I see a deer. A deer in the woods, walking alone. Why is he alone? Why doesn't he have any deer friends? A rabbit or, or a skunk? Like that Disney movie? Shh. He's alone in the woods. And, and he sees those eyes, red eyes, in the dark woods, approaching slowly, and he cannot run. Why can't you run, little deer? No one taught you how to run? Um, Bert? Bert snaps out of it. I think I had a vision. I do not know what it means, uh, but, but it seems important. Vincent stands up and walks away from the fire. Sam follows. You all right? deer we need a deer in the show excuse me like a real deer bare beds and furnishings night chuck jeffrey and veronica load all of their items in the unused straw bag into a rusty old couch all right let's go rowan struggles to open the window veronica takes a heavy item and throws it at the window smashing it veronica puts her hand on rowan's shoulder you're doing great honey she exits out the window rowan follows dudes chuck and jeffrey lift the couch and scuttle toward the exit they struggle to get the couch out through the window. Chuck lifts the leg of the couch outside while Jeffrey lifts the other leg inside the store. Okay, okay, okay. We're gonna need to turn it a bit. Ready, and- They turn the couch. Jeffrey leans on the glass face and it falls to the ground, shattering. Shit, was that you, Jeffrey? Yep, <laughs> my bad. Uh, there's no room on the side. I'm gonna turn it to the other side. Okay, and three, two, one. The couch hits another glass item and it shatters on the ground. God damn it. All right, let's just push through the, okay. And all right. They both shove with all their might and get to the couch through the window. No progress. Oh, it's the bottom. Okay, I, I'm gonna tilt it, okay? Toward you, okay? What? what? I'm gonna get on this table, slant it. Wait, 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 and, wait, Jeffrey, that is- And lift. They both lift. Jeffrey gets onto the table next to the window. He proceeds to smash several more store items. They finally get the couch outside with all their items. They all stand outside on the sidewalk with their full and stolen furniture. Where's the car? I didn't bring it. You didn't bring it? I thought you had the Fiat. I, I didn't think we'd need it. I mean, I, I thought we were being picked up. By who? This was your plan, Jeffrey. I trusted you. The cast is counting on us. Guys, guys. Oh my God, I thought we had a plan here, Jeffrey. We went over this. This is really big deal. Guys, we've got people coming our way. Okay, crap. Okay, okay, everyone. Go, 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 go. Veronica, Rowan, Chuck, and Jeffrey dash off with the couch and everything on it. I am not on board with this. 
White House stage, day. The stolen furnishings are all placed in a corner by the stage. Vincent views the furnishings. Rowan sits near the stage. Great work. How'd you get this? You don't want to know. Sounds good. Vincent moves away from the furnishings to downstage where he can view the full stage. Sam sits near him. All right, people get into position. On such a stage, we reveal a group of dance students. Who are these people? Dance people for the fight scene. There's a fight scene? Don't worry, they're really good. If you say so. Vincent sits down and points toward the dance students. Okay, now dancer A, initiate loaded dance and cross kick dancer B across the face. Dancer C, jump over dancer D and sweep the leg of dancer A under her second kick. Dancer E, tumble and initiate contact with dancer D at three points of contact. A, B, D, and E recover. Dancer C, hit your marks. A, B, D, and E, don't forget your knacks. Begin! The dance students commit fully to the choreography. It falls, falls apart very quickly. Vincent leans in towards Sam. How are we doing on the deer? No deer. I've tried. I mean, I've... It's fine. It's fine, Sam. I'm glad you're involved in the show. Thanks. The manager of Lighthouse enters the space, a little unsettled by the pile of disoriented dance students. Hey, you here to check up on us? Yeah, can we talk to you for a moment? The Lighthouse, day. The manager, Vincent, Veronica, Sam, and Chuck walk toward a table. The cafe is otherwise empty. The manager sits down at the table. Vincent, Sam, Veronica, and Chuck join him across it. So what's going on? First off, I want you to know that this is not your fault. And if I had my way, we would have the show. <laughs> Sorry? The cafe struggled to make ends meet for a while. What do you mean? I see people here all the time. Not enough, unfortunately. The, the building's been bought up by a bigger company. What about us? The building's going to be closed for the duration of your show, so you have a few options. Options? There are a number of smaller theater spaces I know that may work for a later date. Later smaller? date? I know this is not what you expected, but my hands are tied. Is there anything else you can do? As I said, there are a couple of smaller spaces in the area. I mean, I could put in a word for you. We can't do a later show. I don't think you have a choice here. Who bought this place? Excuse me? Who bought you out? I, uh... Was it Draco? Draco? It was a chain. Uh, Sereno. They're owned by Draco. How did you... You're filter? playing into their hands. They're trying to sabotage us. <laughs> I don't think a big corporation cares or even knows about a community theater production. Fucking us. They know what we're up to. I'm going to need you to calm down right now. Well, Vincent, chill out. Like you, Chuck, do you even care? I mean, I'm indifferent, you know? Sturdy as a mountain. Not helping, Chuck. Look, I lost my cool the other night, Veronica. You saw it. I don't like it. I'm starting to care too much. No one's listening. No one else in this world cares. We're the only ones who care, and we can't do shit. Look. Vincent. Vincent. Vincent, look at me. Vincent starts to laugh nervously, uncontrollably. Oh, no. <laughs> Vincent, look at me. Veronica holds on to Vincent's <laughs> face. He laughs maniacally. Vincent, you there? You remember those 80s movies where like a gang of kids would just grab a bike and go on an adventure somewhere? Vincent. I want to do that. You want to, you want, let's go. Let's just go. Let's have an adventure on a bike somewhere. That sounds like a great idea. Let's, let's walk for a bit. Veronica and Vincent stand up together. This is all my fault. This isn't your fault, Sam. Veronica takes Vincent outside. For what it's worth, I'm terribly sorry. Sam's face. She starts to relax. The class bell rings and Graymore classroom. Day. The next day, Sam puts notebooks in her backpack as class ends. She pulls out her phone and sees a text. Crowds of students rush to their next classes. Against the current of students, Sam pushes toward Rowan, who is heading to her next class. Rowan. Rowan. Rowan turns around to face Sam. Sam. Your text. You're not in the show anymore? Sam, I'm sorry. What is this about? I'm not doing the show anymore, Sam. My grades are falling apart. I need to get my shit together. The bell rings to the minute mark. I've got to get to class, Sam. I'm sorry. Rowan heads off. Sam follows her. No, wait. You're quitting? Just like that? What about the world? The world needs us. Sam, I've got other responsibilities. You can't do this. The world is falling apart, Rowan. We need you. Look, I know you care about the show, but I don't have any power in this. Please, Rowan, don't. I'm sorry, Sam. I wish there was more I could do, but I need to get to class. Rowan enters her classroom, leaving Sam alone. Sam's living room, day. Sam opens and closes the front door behind her after a long day at school. Sam's father and mother sit in the living room with a computer. Hey, Dad. Sam, can we talk to you for a minute? She puts her backpack down and enters the room. Yeah, what's this about? You want to explain this? Sam's father turns the computer to Sam, showing an email from her teacher. Shit. The source bibliography thing. You missed it. It's worth a lot. I know that. You told me you had a handle on this. 
No, I did. It's just... Sam, we can't have this. You have an actual shot at getting into a good college and you're blowing it. What if I, what if I don't want that? You want to be able to choose your own career and the life you want. You can't do that if you Dad, can't do this. Your mother and I have made a decision. What decision? Until you get your grades up, you can't do the play. What? You have a source project due next Friday. And for all I know, you haven't even started it yet. Right now, that's your priority. That's bullshit. Watch it. Play is way more important right now. You don't understand. I know you've made some good friends from this, but right now. We no, can't that's not have it. you flunk out. We're flunking out right now. I can't do both. Please School just let needs me. to be your priority right now. Sam's room, day. Sam paces back and forth alone in her room. She takes a breath and calls Vincent on her cell phone. Vincent. Hey, what's up? Um, Vincent, there's something I've got to tell you. What is it? Sam, what is it? I can't do the show anymore, Vincent. What do you mean you can't do the show anymore? I can't do the show anymore. Why not? I just can't. I I'm sorry. Don't do this, Sam. My parents won't let me, Vincent. Do you know it's at stake? I don't have a choice. You never believed in this. That's not true. You never believed in what we were trying to do. I believed more than anything. The world is in danger, Sam. We were entrusted to save it. I wish I could. Forget it. We'll do it without you. Vincent. The call ends. She lets go and starts to have a panic attack. She cries and stims uncontrollably, nervously hitting her head again and again. She collapses to the floor, alone. We stay with her. Grimoire class study hall, day. Rowan works on her source project in the study hall. She stares blankly into her computer screen, glaring at a blank page. She looks around. No one gives her a glance. She pulls out her cell phone. No phones. Rowan puts her phone back in her pocket. Her feet are restless. She looks at the clock, then the window. Then she tries to start her source project again. Grimoire class hallway, late afternoon. Sam sits down in class hallway late in the afternoon. She takes notes and works on a source project alongside the other students. A sunset pierces through the teacher's office's window and hits the tiles of the hallway floor. Sam looks out at the sunset. Grimoire main hallway, night. A different hallway. Sam walks down and carries her backpack. She notices an open window. She walks over and sees that it leads to a section of the roof on the school. She looks back inside the school for a second and then goes out through the window. Sam's feet land on the roof. It is lightly raining. Sam finds Veronica sitting on the edge of the roof. Veronica has been crying. Veronica? Sam. It's quiet up here. Yeah. We can, can we get in tr trouble for... Shouldn't we be... Have you been... I'm sorry about the show. I feel like I let everyone down. The show was falling apart before you left. You had nothing to do with it. Have you talked to the rest of the cast? I said my goodbyes. Goodbyes? Just a feeling. I've seen it before. People disappear. I don't want people to disappear. I know you don't. I'm sorry about what happened with you and Vincent. Feels like I'm frozen in time up here. Yeah. Listen. Sam and Veronica share a moment of silence on the roof. Veronica closes her eyes. Sam does too. The sound of car wheels swooshing through wet pavement, light humming of the streetlights. Sam opens her eyes. She looks at Veronica. Veronica looks forward and a tear runs down her face. She turns to Sam and hides her sadness with another smile. She drops the smile, revealing a teenage girl, heartbroken. Unsure what to say or do, Sam just sits with her. Grimoire Classroom. Day. Sam sits in class, deep in thought. Images. The beach. The blasts of fire. The factory. The glasses in the woods. Sam's face trapped in an endless hallway. The hallway moves forward. Ominous drums. Her face. She yells. Silence. Sam's room. Day. Sam lays alone in her bed, corpse-like. The lights in her room are off. Sam's mother comes in. Sam, one of your friends is here. Okay, cool. Sam checks her phone and goes downstairs. Sam opens the front door to Rowan. Hi. Hi. Sam sits on her bed in her room. Rowan sits on a chair. 
I'm sorry about how things were left. No problem. I heard you quit too. Everyone did. Things just fell apart. I didn't know. I'm scared. You were right. We had other responsibilities. We put too much on ourselves. We'll do something about it later. Someday. You maybe. Why do you say that? The show fell apart because of me. I screwed it all up. You didn't screw anything up. I feel like I did. I you don't usually get that sort of attention. It felt good. Yeah? I feel like I'm driving and it's all dark and I can't see where I'm going, but I have to look like I know where I'm going. And so every day I wake up too early, get dressed, go to school, and I put on a mask so that nobody suspects anything, so that people think I'm normal. And it works. But I'm so tired. I'm so tired of hiding every day. My parents, Veronica, they all I'll say I should just be myself, but I don't even know what that looks like. I don't know how to take off the mask. Maybe your mask doesn't need to hide who you are. Maybe it can, I don't know, shout it. How do I do that, Rowan? I don't know. It's yours. No one else's. No one, you get to make it however you want. Sam looks at her for a moment. She doesn't quite understand what she is saying, but she doesn't reject it outright either. I don't know what else to say. But I'm here. You don't have to put anything on for me. Sam and Rowan sit together. No words. Just two friends in silence. Sam looks forward at the Lego set in her room. She looks at it a bit longer. Her eyes light up a bit. Image. One more vision of the beach in the post-apocalyptic future. But this time, Sam walks across the beach. She goes toward the nearby woods and sees her white sneakers. Nearby, she picks up a buried piece of red plastic. She rubs the dirt off to reveal a Lego piece. She looks onward to see the industrial plant in the woods. It is surrounded by a fence and a sign. Reynolds Experimental Plant, Draco Incorporated. Sam snaps back into a room with Rowan. Re Reynolds, Draco, we can bring the show back. What? My vision, the end of the world. I know how it happens. Mm -hmm. you, you know that Mario game where there's that staircase that leads to the final boss and you keep going up and keep going up and it never ends? That's been my brain for the last few days. Yeah. Sam gets her backpack and starts packing. But I figured it out. We can. We just need to get the rest of the cast and... Sam, we don't have time. We need a week of tech and we don't even have a space. We don't need any of that. What do you mean? Today. That's all we need. Sam. You don't need to believe me. Just trust me on this. Sam. One day. Sam's living room. Day. A packet drops on the table. Sam and Roman stand in Sam's living room with Sam's mother and father. What's this? My source project. What I have done right now. Bibliography, analysis, all of it. Rowan helped me with what I missed in class. Sam. Can we give me one afternoon? Just today. I can study tomorrow and the rest of the weekend, but I need this, Dad. Just one night with my friends. Sam's mother and father look at each other. One day. Be back before 11. Thank you. Thank you. Sam and Rowan rush out the door. Chuck's apartment. Day. Sam, Rowan, and Bert stand outside Chuck's apartment. Chuck! Hey, Chuck! Chuck? He's not answering. I can see that. What do we do? Bert moves to the front door and takes out lockpicks from his coat and uses them on the front door. The door opens. Did you just... Bert walks inside. Is that legal? Sam and Rowan enter after Bert. Bert, Sam, and Rowan walk through Chuck's living room. They follow the sound of crying and a ukulele to a bathroom. But they slowly open the door. Chuck sits on the floor, playing. Oh, shit. Chuck, are you all right? I'm fine. Bert, Rowan, and Sam all sit on the floor with Chuck. You're crying. Yeah. Yeah, a bit. <laughs> I'm just sad. I get sad about the show. We're all sad about the show. It just meant so much to me, you know? Oh, well, I'm glad you guys came. How do you get in? A lock. Good thinking. Chuck holds in for a second longer. He then totally breaks down, ugly crying in cartoonish fashion. <laughs> I just miss you guys so much. <laughs> Chuck crumbles into Bert's arms, his head burrowed in Bert's coat. Bert holds him somewhat uncomfortably. It's okay. I just feel so sad. It's okay to feel sad. <laughs> I feel so vulnerable. <laughs> it's okay to feel vulnerable. Vulnerable is good. We like vulnerability. Chuck, I've got some good news. I think we might be able to give him a moment, okay, Sam? Yeah. Okay. Chuck cries it out. They continue to sit on the floor with him. The lighthouse afternoon, the closed sign on the front door. Coming soon, New Sereno Cafe, subsidiary of Draco Corporation.
Reveal the lighthouse is the site being closed. Vincent sits on the bench, facing it. Sam dashes to the lighthouse and sees Vincent. Vincent! Vincent! Vincent turns to face her. Sam. Vincent, listen. We don't have a lot of time, but I think we can save the show. The show is dead, Sam. I failed you. The world will end and- Reynolds Plant. That's how it happens. Reynolds, I, I don't know his first name. He goes to our school. He's supposed to get a call from this big company, Drinko, an internship with them. Reynolds, he's a nice guy. Yeah, but what if that internship sends him down a path and he becomes assimilated like that alien thing in the, that 80s movie, the, the, the one that goes, ah, this is it. Sam. The woods, the park, put the play on there. Where there's no cell reception. Exactly. We can stop that call from ever happening. Can't they just call him back? Maybe, but I think this is it. We put the play on, show someone a different path, and take one from the system. We don't have a script. Then write something. What do I write? What do you want to write about? The woods. Day. Vincent and Rowan bike down into the woods. There, the gang has already set up camp by the Fiat. Bert has brought large bags of tools and wood. Jeffrey has brought his cardboard box of makeshift lighting and sound equipment. Vincent and Rowan park their bikes in the center of the action. The rest of the actors swarm behind them. Vincent hands out pages to each of the actors, Veronica, Chuck, and Rowan. Okay, everyone, here are your parts. They're pretty similar to what we rehearsed. There are a few minor changes I'll go over with each of you. Okay, we have one hour to get ready. Vincent, did you get him to come? Yeah, Reynolds is coming. Got confirmation. Great. Jeffrey, you have the walkie-talkies. Yep. Jeffrey unloads a box filled with walkie-talkies. Each character gets a walkie-talkie. We'll use these to communicate. Set up camp. Go over your parts. Let's save the world. They all run off to positions. Sam runs into another direction. Vincent and Rowan follow her, puzzled. Sam moves to a familiar spot of grass and takes off her remaining white sneakers, leaving them in the dirt, as well as a small Lego piece. This is a good luck charm. I still don't understand. Sam turns to Vincent and Rowan. She looks crazed, almost on crack. Look, all we need to do is create a moment, a single moment of time now. Okay, we do that. The community is going to have something to remember. We're going to re- have something to remember. So the battle is 5, 10, 20 years from now. We're going to look back on this and see that we won. We already fucking won, and there's nothing that they can do about it. It looks small, and it is small, but it does have an impact. It has an enormous impact, and we just don't see it yet. We're going to make this show. We're going to give it to that audience, and we're going to fuck them in the face with it, consensually. We're going to consensually fuck them in the face. Backstage in the woods. Night. Audiences start to trickle in. Bert's gambling crew and the dance students from earlier all gather in sections of the audience. Families and friends bring folding chairs and blankets. A small, modest audience. Sam sees that her parents have come in with two folding chairs of their own. My parents are here. Reynolds also arrives with a folding chair. With him, he holds a baby. Is that a baby? It's his brother. It's the only way I could get him to come. That's really irresponsible. He's adorable. Remember, he stays for the duration of the show. Make sure he doesn't leave. Sam tosses Vincent the walkie-talkie. Got it. I'll keep you posted. Wait. What? I don't remember his first name. You don't remember his first name? I don't know his first name. It doesn't matter. Go. Go. Okay. Okay. Vincent leaves and goes into the audience to socialize with the audience. Hey. Vincent. Nice to see you, dude. (laughs) Yeah, you too. Aw, he's cute, isn't he? The baby looks at Vincent. The baby smiles. Someone's happy. Vincent gives Reynolds a fake smile. Chuck fiddles with his walkie-talkie. He picks up a transmission. We hear a voice. Oh, crap. What? Our guys are indeed tonight. Which means... It means that if any of the park guards are see us, uh, we get shut down. We don't have a permit. Crap. Do we have any park guards in the, our area? There's a building to the north. A park guard is stationed there. We can grab him. Grab him? I can put him in a bag. Jeffrey holds up a large cloth bag. I would, no, put that away. Jeffrey puts the bag away. I can stall him. We need you on stage. My part isn't on for a while. All I need to do is buy you some time, right? I'll be back before my first line. Okay, go, go. Veronica runs off. Sam, Chuck, and Rowan look to the audience, ready to perform. Jeffrey cracks open one of his light contraptions and... Let the magic begin. The show opens. Vincent and Reynolds sit together with Reynolds holding his baby brother. Vincent smiles at the opening of the show. Things are going according to plan. But then, he smells something. He sniffs again to be sure. He looks at the baby brother, who gives him a big, mischievous smile. Vincent scowls at him. 
near the park security. Night. The security guard stands watch, bored. He finds some way to entertain himself. He looks off and sees lights. He starts walking over in the direction of the stage. He hears a yell of pain. He turns ah. around and sees Veronica, who has fallen over. Oh my god, are you okay? He pulls her up. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm just, ah. Okay, I'm gonna get a first aid kit. Thank you so much. He runs off. She looks down at her cell phone and sees that she has three bars. Audience in the woods, night. Vincent has gotten out of sight from the audience. He's on his walkie-talkie, giving the cast an update. I'm telling you, he's gonna have to leave. That can't happen. What am I supposed to do, change his brother for him? I don't know, figure something out. Vincent hangs up. He looks back at Reynolds and his brother. At all costs. Hey, can you save my seat? I'm gonna need to change him. I can take care of it. I don't want you to miss the show. Really? Yeah, I'm the diaper changing master. Okay, but only because I hate doing it. Plus, he likes you. Reynolds hands Vincent the baby, wipes, and spare diapers. Vincent takes a hold of all of it and walks off. Backstage, night. Close on Sam's cell phone, she looks at it and sees her reception is good. Chuck is on the walkie-talkie with Veronica. Why is the reception working? I don't know. I guess they fixed it. Fixed it? He cannot get that call. Bert stands up. I know where the tower is. I can investigate. You think you could turn it back off? Yeah, I've done it before. Okay, go, now. Bert runs off to disable the cell tower. Vincent runs towards the building where he can manage the baby's diaper. She matches eyes with Veronica. Both are shocked. The guard comes by with a first aid kit. Vincent moves out of sight. Okay, here you go. Thank you. I, I think I'm good to walk. Okay. I'm going to need to check up on- The guard almost sees Vincent, but Veronica screams. <laughs> the guard is startled. Veronica starts laughing uncontrollably. I'm sorry. I thought I saw something. Okay. Vincent tries to open the door to the building, but it's locked. He walks in the frame again. The guard almost sees him again. Oh my god, there it is! What? She points behind him away from Vincent. He turns to see, and Vincent signals to Veronica that the door is locked. Right there! I don't see it. He turns. Vincent moves out of sight. He turns back, and Veronica uses this opportunity to snatch his keys and toss them to Vincent. Vincent heads to the bathroom. He puts the baby on the table with the spare diaper and wipes. He takes a deep breath. The radio tower. Night. Bert arrives at the radio tower. He looks up and realizes that he has to climb it. Without hesitation, he begins to scale the tower with a pair of scissors in his mouth. He gets to the top and fills with a machine. He pulls out his scissors and checks the different wires. Which one is this? Bert, in a moment of blind faith, cuts a wire. Blast! The shock of electricity blasts Bert in the face. He tumbles down the tower like an actor from the silent era. His coat catches on something and he spirals out of control. He grabs hold of a tree branch, coatless. The branch holds his weight for one, two, three seconds before he falls again, landing flat on his face on the ground. At the stage, all lights suddenly shut off. The entire stage, including the audience, is in pitch black. Oh no. Rowan approaches and addresses Sam. Where's the power? I don't know. We need to find Bert. Rowan runs off to find Bert. At the corner of the building, Veronica leans on the building, pretending to pay attention to the guard. Yeah, but you know, my girlfriend has been really supportive of this whole thing. It's just, I need to get out of my parents' house. I feel like I'm in total limbo. Yeah, I totally get how you're feeling. Radio tower, night. Bert recovers from his fall. From the ground, he pulls his head up. He hears a menacing growl in front of him. His eyes immediately whiten. His body darts up like a meerkat. Facing him, uh, six feet away, is a large black bear. Uh, Rowan collapses to behind a hill where she can scope out the situation. Watch the language, no swearing. Back at the stage, the power is still out. We get reactions from the people in the audience. Reynolds sits in the audience, confused. Bert's cam gambling crew uses a lighter to give themselves some light and have a game. The dance students look around the space, confused and unsure of what to do. Back at the bear radio tower, Bert maintains strong eye contact with the bear. Bert looks at the bear. The bear looks at him. Neither are backing down. Rowan stays prone at a nearby hill. She communicates on her walkie-talkie. Any update? No, neither of them are moving. What the hell are we supposed to do? Language! No swearing! We hear the sound of a baby on the walkie-talkie. Chuck comes over to Rowan to see what's going on. What is going... What's going on? Bert ran into a bear. Oh, fuck. The walkie-talkie utters a static mumble. Bert starts to square up. 
making himself in his black coat look as large as possible. Wait, something's happening. Bert doesn't break eye contact with the bear. The bear stays for a moment, <clears throat> then turns, slowly walking back from where he came from. When the bear is finally out of sight, Bert takes a deep breath. The crazed look in his eye remains, and a single tear runs down his cheek. Rowan and Chuck walk down the hill to Bert. Did that just... He won't be coming back. Rowan, Chuck, did you check on Bert? I got this. Go. Rowan and Chuck run back towards the stage. Backstage in the woods. Night. Jeffrey sees his friends in struggle. He sees the audience, patiently waiting, but starting to get tired. His eyes suddenly widen, as if a light switched on. He runs to the Fiat and grabs an exercise ball. He runs back to his lighting and sound station. He rubs his hair against the exercise ball until it starts to stick up. He places his head of hair into an open circuit. Power returns. Sam gasps, a sigh of relief. Near park security, night. Vincent finally succeeds in changing the baby's diaper. Veronica continues to walk to talk to the guard. Well, thank you for helping me out. Veronica steps outside and peers over at the side of the building. She sees Vincent run off with the baby, away from the frame and into the distance. She gives off a smug smile. No problem. It's my job. Gotta make sure you guys- t- We got yeah, a report of a public gathering violation. violation. Can someone check it out? I've got it covered. Veronica snatches the guard's key and, come and climbs, climbs up the side of the building. What the? Get down! I need those! Veronica stands on the roof of the building, swinging the keys and dancing. I'm Mary fucking Reed! Audience in the woods. Night. The audience watches the show on stage. Reynolds looks around for Vincent, worried about his brother. Vincent arrives and gives the baby back to Reynolds. Chuck looks into the audience and sees that Vincent has returned. He gets a call from Veronica on his walkie-talkie. Veronica, where are you? I'm tied up here. I'm not going to, to be able to go on. Shit. There's not a chance? Nope. I'm stuck up here. You need to put someone in my place. It's impossible. Nobody has your part. Chuck looks at Sam. Sam, uh, you know the play, right? What? Yeah, she knows the whole script. The whole thing? I mean, a bit, yeah. I'm, I'm not a savant, if that's what you're thinking, but... Can you do it? Yes, I can do it. What do you need? Um, I need a script, a pen, and some water. Beautiful. Okay. Chuck leads Sam towards the stage. He gives her a script. He runs off. Sam opens the script and flips to Veronica's entrance. You got this, sweetheart. Come and get me, you drones! Audience in the woods. Night. Close on Reynolds' cell phone. The time turns from 7.43 to 7.44. The radio tower. Night. Bert grabs hold of the ladder of the radio tower. He climbs it one more time. He fills with the machine again, this time certain about the various cords and wires. This one. Bert takes his scissors and cuts another wire. Reynolds' cell phone buzzes. It's from Draco Incorporated. I need to take this. Reynolds steps away, leaving Vincent with his brother. Reynolds answers his phone, only for the call to cut off. Service here. Backstage in the woods. Night. Sam waits backstage, memorizing lines and marking them with a pen. She drinks from a water bottle and takes a breath. Time slows down, and she makes her entrance. Reynolds pays attention to Sam on stage. Sam's parents watch their daughter perform. Veronica sees Sam perform from the security office roof. Backstage in the woods. Night. Off stage, Sam gets out of her costume pieces and sneaks around the stage towards the audience. Where are you going? I'm going to sit in the audience. I want to see the rest of it. She walks off and sits on the grass next to her parents. Her mother and father look at her and then back at the show. Sam looks at the audience and sees a dark figure standing in the distance, the stranger looking right at her, smiling. Beautiful light blasts in her face, and gusts of wind blow her hair back like the residue of a rocket. She starts to float, flying away from the audience. Suddenly, Sam is on the beach, but this time, time begins to rewind. The tide comes back and the starfish go back into the sea. Dead grass and trees turn from gray back to natural green. The once blasting fire extinguishes and the blue sky returns. Sam smiles heavily. She yells out the op of victory and laughs hysterically. Yes! Sam is suddenly then thrown back into the grass, watching the show. She looks at her friends on stage and cannot stop smiling. The show ends and the actors all take their bows. Sam looks at her mother and father, who both smile at her. The woods, backstage area, night. Rowan, Veronica, Chuck, and Jeffrey all freak out and start congratulating each other. Chuck, tears in his eyes, grabs hold of Bert, Bert, Rowan, and Jeffrey like a bear. 
guys, I'm so proud of you. Look what my mom brought. He reveals a basket of baked goods. You made these? Yeah, maybe. Bert comes back from his corner around the stage. He's still a little shaken from his encounter with the bear. Bert, you looked really brave out there. Thank you. Rowan hugs him. She glances at the stage and sees the stolen furniture. We're going to return the furniture, right? Yeah, yeah. Sam joins the rest of the group. She joins a group hug with the rest of the cast. Chuck, it worked. We saved the world. We did? Yes, we did. Oh my gosh. You want to try one of these? Try one of these. They're so good. Chuck tries to place the muffin in her mouth unsuccessfully. She takes it. She finds Rowan. Rowan, it worked. Bert. The show, it saved the world. If you say so. Sam looks at Rowan, unsure how to read her. Sam looks at the rest of the cast, puzzled. The woods, backstage area, night. An hour or so has passed. The scene is lit by a fire. The cast is lit. Sam goes over to the collection of props and grabs a pair of white shoes with paint all over them. She crouches in a corner, out of sight from everyone, and tries the shoes on. Chuck, Rowan, Jeffrey, and Bert all sit and laugh at the fire. Sam moves away from the cast and sits on the ground, alone. Rowan sees her by herself and walks over to join her. Everything all right? Yeah. You're sitting here all by yourself. Yep. You mind if I sit with you? No, sure. Rowan sits on the ground with her. They sit in silence. Thank you, Rowan. For what? Nothing. Sam holds Rowan's hand. They continue to sit in silence. Sam sees Veronica off from the fire, also by herself. The same night, at the same fire. More time has passed. Rowan has returned to the fire with Chuck, Bert, and Jeffrey. Sam walks over to Veronica, who stands away from the group. I gotta leave soon. I just wanted to... Veronica looks back at Vincent, who sits on the log alone. I'll talk to him. Veronica turns to Sam. She holds Sam's cheek and gives her a sad but genuine smile. What an exciting role you've played today. Sam joins Vincent on the log. We did it. We did. I thought you'd be happier. The show worked. It saved the world. Did it? Yes. You don't see it? This is a great show, Sam. You really should be proud. Your show, too. I'm sorry. I'm ruining it for you guys. Vincent, I've seen your visions. Our mission. It worked. The world is safe. Safe? You don't believe me. I'm sorry, Sam. I thought I could do more. Sam and Vincent look at each other. Vincent remains lost. Two friends sit on a log near a fire. Clothes on Sam's colorful shoes. Fade to Graymore High School. Day. Sam's shoes, but on the pavement in the day. Sam sits alone in the curve during outdoor lunch. She glances at a graded source project. C+. Plus. She puts it away. Instead of wearing the white, grayish clothes she wore in her introduction, she wears torn jeans, a bright yellow shirt, a bandana, suspenders, and rings. Sam looks and sees other students sitting, standing and talking from a distance. She closes her eyes and listens for a minute, similar to Veronica on the roof. Sounds of footsteps and cars. Sam opens her eyes and smiles. She puts on headphones and begins to play music. Another sunny rock song begins to play. Sam's foot begins to tap to the music. She stands up and starts to dance. Sam's shoes walk on the sidewalk and beat to the music. Sam walks down the sidewalk, listening to the music. Her dancing starts slow and then gets more energetic and frantic, resembling stimming. She looks at the, she looks at the May sun and feels its warmth on her face. She is alive. She is alive. She is alive. She dances and dances, similar to Vincent near the opening of the film, and the camera lifts us up to the sky. Fade out. Everyone? Uh, thank you. Uh, the end. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, thank you again. Um, and we'll, I guess we'll call call it a, a, the end of the end of the stream. Just we'll end it here. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, this has been Day of the Greeks. Um, you can check out the Not So Royal Shakespeare Company on Facebook and Instagram. It's a great company. You guys should really check it out. Thank you.